Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. But Scrooge never painted out his name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. And no man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Once upon a time, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, and the fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole. The door in Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that he put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle. Suddenly the street door opened, and a cheerful voice, the voice of Scrooge's nephew, cried, A Merry Christmas, Uncle! Christmas? Bah! Humbug! Christmas or humbug? Oh, oh, you don't mean that, I'm sure, Uncle. I do. Merry Christmas. What reason have you to be merry? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Bah! Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Come, Uncle, dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you damn first. But why? Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry for you, Uncle, with all my heart. But I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. A Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left, only stopping to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. And a very Merry Christmas to you too, sir. There's another fellow, Mike Clark, with 15 shillings a week, a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. Ha! <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. But this lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let someone else in. It was a portly gentleman, pleasant to behold, who now stood with his hat off in Scrooge's office. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe... Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. Seven years this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor? Both very busy, sir. I'm glad to hear it. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I've mentioned and those who are badly off must go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir. Seeing that it would be useless to pursue the matter further, the gentleman withdrew, and Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head. The cold became intense. The 
brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should. And even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. In the piercing, searching, biting cold, a boy stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized a ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool, and the expectant clerk in the tank snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, Cratchit? If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. It's only once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, with a fog and frost hung about the black old gateway. There was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large, and Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. But when he put his key in the lock, he saw in the knocker Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by a breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it became a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key, turned it, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution, and he did look cautiously behind the door, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Oh, oh, and closed it with a bang which resounded through the house like thunder. He fastened the door, walked across the hall and up the stairs, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But this night, before he shut his own heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in, took off his cravat put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the fire to take his grill. 
His glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. They ceased as suddenly as they had begun, and were succeeded by a clanking noise, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the cellar, the door of which flew open with a booming sound. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door, then through the door and into the room. It was Marley. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, and with a kerchief bound around his head and chin. The chain he drew was long and wound about him like a tail. It was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. I won't believe it, said Scrooge to himself. And then, aloud, What do you want with me? But Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was Jacob Marley, your partner. Can you... Can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. You don't believe in me. I don't. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees, clasping his hands before his face. Do you believe in me or not? I must, I must. You are fettered. Why? I wear the chain I forged in life. Is its pattern strange to you? Jacob, old Jacob, Marley, oh, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge. But my time is nearly gone, hear me. I will, but don't be too hard on me, Jacob, pray. I am here to tell you, Ebenezer, that you have yet a chance of escaping my fate. You're always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. The second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night on the last stroke of twelve. Remember what has passed between us. The spectre took its wrapper from the table, bound it round its head as before, rose, wound its chain over its arm and walked backwards towards the window, which at every step raised itself a little so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, and of wailing inexpressibly sorrowful. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in a mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Desperate in his curiosity, Scrooge ran to the window, The air filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither, moaning as they went. 
Each one wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some were linked together. None were free. Their misery was that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded. And Scrooge, closing the window, examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, hum, uh, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotions he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was so dark that he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven, twelve. It was past two when I went to bed. An icicle must have got into the works. I can't have slept through a whole day and into another night. He scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All he could make out that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. He went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and over. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly, and he remembered, on a sudden, that he'd been warned of a visitation when the bell tolled one. A quarter past. Half past. Quarter two. The hour itself and nothing else. But as the bell sounded, light flashed up in the room. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. What has brought you here? Your welfare. Come. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the bed was warm, the thermometer a long way below freezing. He was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, that he had a cold upon him. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, but it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. You recollect the way? I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies were trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts. All were in great spirits, and shouted to each other, until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. Scrooge knew and named them, every one. Why did his cold eye glisten, and his heart leap up, as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? 
What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. The walls were damp and mossy, the windows broken and the gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. They went across the hall to a door which opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room made barer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down and wept to see his poor, forgotten self. What is the matter? Nothing. I wish... There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and, waving its hand, said, Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you. He only knew that there he was, alone again. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge turned to the ghost and then glanced anxiously towards the door. Fun! Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home. Home, Fun? Yes, home. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He spoke so gently to me one night that I was not afraid to ask if you might come home. And he said yes and sent me to bring you. <laughs> she clapped her hands and laughed and dragged him in her childish eagerness towards the door. When at last his trunk was tied up on the top of the chaise, they bade the schoolmaster goodbye and drove gaily away, the quick wheels dashing the hoarfrost and snow off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. She died, but had, I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, and shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. They went in and at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he'd been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, and laughed all over himself, and called out, yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice, Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. You hold the boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, the Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three. Had them up in their places. Four, five, six. Barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine. And came back before you could have got to twelve. Panting like racehorses. Hilly ho, clear away, my lads. Let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick. Shut up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There's nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. 
It was done in a minute. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped on the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright as a ballroom should be. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. There were dances, there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boil, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and the boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley and old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. When the clock struck eleven, they took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two prentices, they did the same to them. And so the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under the counter in the back shop. A small matter to make these silly folk so full of gratitude. Small? He gave great happiness. What is the matter? Nothing. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Come. Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in whose eyes were tears. A golden idol has displaced me. If it can cheer and comfort you as I would have done, I have no cause to grieve. May you be happy in the life you've chosen. Spirit, why do you torture me? Do not blame me. These were shadows of things that have been. Haunt me no longer. Scrooge turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. It did not resist, but he, overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. But being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. Consequently, when the bell struck and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. But all this time he lay upon his bed in a blaze of light which was more alarming than a dozen ghosts. At last he began to think that the source of this ghostly light must be in the adjoining room. So he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his room. There was no doubt about that. But walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. 
Heaped on the floor were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn. Great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch. And amongst them sat a jolly giant, glorious to see. Come in! I am the ghost of Christmas present. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. If you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did what he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings and fruit all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their heart's content. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, glancing demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids, there were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy person, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly closed, but perhaps two shutters down or one. But through those gaps, such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest looker-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager, in hopeful promise of the day, that they tumbled up against each other, crashing their wicker baskets wildly and left their purchases on the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed a hundred of the like mistakes in the best humour possible. They went on, invisible, straight to his clerk's dwelling where they saw Mrs. Cratchit, Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed out poorly in a twice-turned gown but brave in ribbons which make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired. And now the two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, 
screaming that outside the bakers they'd smelt the goose and known it for their own. And, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, whilst he blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Where's your precious father and your brother, Tiny Tim? Is Martha, Mother? Oh, Hurrah! Oh, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, oh, oh, bless your heart alive, me dear, how late you are. Oh, we did a deal of work to finish, Mother. Oh, well, never mind so long as you come. Sit you down before the fire and have a warm, Lord oh, bless you. No! No, here's Father coming and Tiny Tim. Hide, Martha. Oh, hide! <laughs> So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob Cratchit, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Here I am, Father! Oh, <laughs> Martha, my dear! <laughs> and how did little Tim behave? Well, as good as gold and better. He gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this and trembled more when he said that tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. Soon the active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and in came tiny Tim, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made any more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened the apple sauce, and Martha dusted the hot plates. Then Bob took tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons in their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast of the goose. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, a murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even tiny Tim beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was sufficient dinner for the whole family. Everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone to bring in the pudding. In half a minute she returned flushed, but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball blazing in a half-quartern of ignited brandy. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth and Bob proposed. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. Everyone! Oh. <laughs> Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. 
I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner and a crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no. What of it? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head overcome with penitence and grief, but raised it speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge! I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. Oh, my dear, the children. Christmas Day. An odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man is Mr. Scrooge, but I'll drink his health for your sake in the days, not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. (laughs) Merry Christmas! They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, Scrooge has his eyes upon them, especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. But now it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. And as they went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlours and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. They came at last to a bright, dry, gleaming room in which sat Scrooge's nephew and his pretty, dimpled wife. (laughs) He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. And he believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred. Ah, he's a comical old fellow, and to tell the truth, not so pleasant as he might be. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he is very rich. But his wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't even make himself comfortable. I have no patience with him. I'm sorry for him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Always himself. He takes it into his head to dislike us and won't come and dine with us. So he loses some pleasant moments which would do him no harm. Oh, but I pity him. And she'll give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not. Mm-hmm. He may rail as much as he will at Christmas, but he can't help thinking better of it if I go there in good temper year after year and take his hand and say, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. Oh, it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. <laughs> Here. Here is a glass of mulled wine, and I say, Uncle Scrooge, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The scene faded, and the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, and saw it not. But as the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which, concealing its head and form, left nothing visible save one outstretched hand. Are you the ghost of Christmas yet to come? cried Scrooge. The spirit didn't answer, but pointed onward with its hand. You're about to show me things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us? Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant, as if the spirit had inclined its head. Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he could hardly stand when the hand again pointed straight before them. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, but rather it seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. There they were, in the heart of it, among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside some businessmen, and Scrooge advanced to listen to them. I don't know much about it. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What was the matter with him? God knows. What's he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. (laughs) (laughs) It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. I don't know of anybody to go to it. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas. Good morning. That was their meeting, their conversation and their parting. 
Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom with its hand outstretched. They went into an obscure part of the town where the ways were foul and narrow. The shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly, to a low-browed beetling shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones and greasy offal were bought. Sitting among the wares he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a grey-haired rascal who took his pipe from his mouth as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. Open it, Joe, and tell me the value. <coughs> Every person has a right to take care of themselves. They always did. What you call these? Bed curtains? No, bed curtains. You don't mean you took him down, rings and all, with him lying there dead? Why not? Uh, you were born to make your fortune. Don't drop that oil on a blanket. His blankets? No, he isn't likely to take cold without them. <laughs> the scene changed to a dark room with a bare, uncurtained bed on which there lay a something covered up. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. His steady hand was pointing to the head. The motion of a finger would have disclosed the face. Scrooge had longed to do it, but he had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the spectre at his side. Spirit, this is a fearful place. Who is the man? The ghost of Christmas yet to come still did not speak but conveyed him to a churchyard. Walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the spirit stood among the graves and pointed down. Answer me one question, said Scrooge. Are those the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? The ghost, immovable as ever, pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Scrooge crept forward trembling, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit, no. I'm not the man I was. I will honor Christmas in my heart and keep it all the year. Tell me I may sponge away the writing on the stone. In his agony, he clutched the robes and caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Blessed and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Oh, 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 Jacob Marley. Heaven and Christmas time be praised. He was so flattered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice could scarcely answer to his call and his face was wet with tears. They're not... Torn down, he cried, folding one of the bed curtains in his arms. They're here. The shadow of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. His hands were busy with his garments, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them and mislaying them. I, I don't know what to do, he cried, making a perfect lacoon of himself with his stockings. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel, merry as a schoolboy. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello there. Whoop. <laughs> really, for a man who'd been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm a baby. Hello. Oh, 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 there. The churches rang out the lustiest peals he'd ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell. 
Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold. Golden sunlight, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Hey, boy, what's today? Hi. What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it after all. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope so. Oh, an intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes. He's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. No, 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 I mean earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one. But write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the poulterer's man. Here's the turkey. Hello. Whoop. How are you? Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He'd have snapped him off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. It's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab. <laughs> The chuckle with which he said this, the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckled till he <laughs> cried. Shaving was not easy, but his hand shook very much, and shaving requires attention, even when you don't dance while you're at it. But if he'd cut off the end of his nose, he'd have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all at his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were pouring forth and Scrooge looked so irresistibly pleasant that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. He'd not gone far when coming towards him he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before. "'My dear sir,' said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, "'how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. A Merry Christmas to you, sir.' "'Mr. Scrooge?' "'Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be very pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. Will you have the goodness to accept two hundred guineas?' Lord bless me, Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? Not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included. Will you do me that favor? I don't know what to say to such munificence. Don't say anything. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will indeed. Thank you. I'm very much obliged to you. Thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows. He never dreamt that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you if you please. Thank you. He knows me. I'll go in, my dear. Fred, it's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in? Fred, let him in. 
It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be the first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A merry Christmas, Bob, a merry Christmas, my good fellow, than I've given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary. We'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him. But he let them laugh, and little heeded them. For his own heart laughed, and that was good enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. <laughs>